This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All-Hit Radio! Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. Before we get to my uh, guest this hour, Stephen R. Campbell, just to remind you that the x is on the x Broadcast Network. And if you'd like to find out what time and where you can find us on the network, as well as the other great shows that are on the network, including a brand new show that is starting in a couple of weeks from now with my good friend Larry Lawson, Paranormal Stakeout. We also have Dr. Uh, Ask Dr. Gibbs with Dr. Gibbs Williams. We also have... Uh, Dr. Bernie Beitman, who does Connecting with uh, Coincidence, and then Dr. Beverly uh, McGeorge. Just great programming. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, something for you at www.xzbn.net. My guest this hour is Stephen R. Campbell, Exonation. He is the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent, Flourishing at Any Age. He is a speaker and mentor known as the Brain Whisperer. He teaches how your mind can be your greatest adversary and, when understood, can be transformed into your greatest friend and ally. After working in hospital administration for 20 years, Stephen acquired his master's degree in information systems and went on to pursue his greatest love, teaching, where he served as a college professor and eventually educational dean for another 20 years. It was as a professor that Stephen Campbell developed a curriculum based on brain science to help students end negative thinking, improve focus and clarity, and ultimately transform their lives. Stephen uses his 20 years of research and university teaching to present easy-to-understand principles that may be applied immediately to improve the quality of our our lives and our thoughts, while teaching us how to access the true power of our minds. He also shares the latest research about how the brain learns and how much of our own behavior is based not on the truth, but rather on the truth as we perceive it. Joining me now is Stephen R. Campbell. And Stephen, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much for having me. Tell me about your book, Making Your Mind Magnificent, Flourishing at Any Age. Well, the book is really the result of about 20 years of developing curriculum, 20 Mm -hmm. years of study, and 20 years of teaching. 
And it really started back in the early 60s uh, when Dr. Albert Ellis founded Cognitive Psychology. And what he suggested in a little book called The Guide to Rational Living is that everything we could do today is based primarily on what we say to ourselves about ourselves today. Now, when he suggested this, psychologists had a conniption fit. They said, no, 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 the way you are today is because of unresolved childhood conflicts. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was Freudianism. That was followed by behaviorism, Dr. Skinner out of Harvard. That was followed by environmentalism. It's in your environment, your birth or your mom, your dad. And Dr. Yeah. Ellis came back and said, you know what? They're all true. How could they all be true? Here's the principle of cognitive psychology. While you're talking to yourself, mm -hmm. your brain is believing everything you tell it without question. Ooh. So when you say this is just too hard, your brain says, okay, you're right, it is. And it actually makes it hard. That's the scary part. Because here's the wonderful part, and this is what I teach. When you say this is so easy, mm -hmm. when you say I can do this, brain says, Okay, and then it becomes obsessed with finding ways of doing it. Now, the next question that always comes up is, well, what if you're saying is not true? You know, Rob, your brain doesn't even care. Brain doesn't even ask that question. Hmm. And when I learned that in a psychology class years ago, I was really skeptical. There's a wonderful book called um, Phantoms in the Brain, written by Dr. V. S. Ramachandran out of UC San Diego. The phantoms refer to phantom limbs that have been amputated. And a patient will go into a doctor's office, they'll say, you know what, you got to help me, I can't do a thing with that arm. And the doctor may have to say, well, that could be because I amputated an arm six months ago. And the patient says, you didn't tell my brain that. My brain doesn't know what's gone. My brain still wants to pick things up with it. it. Is, is that and phantom, would that, icky. would that be classified as phantom pain? Yes, phantom pain, that's okay. exactly. And they're not really sure where that comes from, but all they know is that the brain still thinks yep. that the that the uh that your arm is there. Right. Uh he told the most amazing story uh back in nineteen thirty two at the height of the Great American Depression. A woman came into a doctor's office in Manhattan by the name of uh, Kathy Knight. All right, we yeah, we're going to have to take Knight. we're going to have to take and, our break uh, here. Please stand by. We'll be okay. back in 2 minutes. Exo Nation our guest is Stephen Campbell, and he's the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent. And his website is, are you ready, XO Nation? StephenRCampbell.com. And we'll both be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My Dialogue with Divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called RISE, May 8th through the 12th, 2017, and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say, it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. A small deposit is required now to reserve your space 
as this retreat, it will sell out. For more details, please go to johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha, and I'll see you in mystical Maui. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'd like to say hello to all our listeners in Europe listening to us on Radio X. And, of course, everyone later on as we go on to talk stream live. Exo Nation, Stephen Campbell is our guest. He is the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent. Now, before we went to that uh, hard break, uh, you had just started to tell us about a lady. So if you could continue that story. Her name was Mary Knight, and we know this is true because we still have the medical records. She walked into a physician's office by the name of Dr. Martin in Manhattan back in 1932, very excited and very pregnant. And she said, uh, my husband has been out of work. You need to give me an exam because I think I'm going to deliver today. So Dr. Martin said, absolutely. So he gave her an exam, and everything was completely normal mm -hmm. except for a couple of hiccups. Her belly button was still an innie, not an outie, yeah. and he couldn't find a fetal heartbeat. In fact, Mary wasn't pregnant at all. She had a condition called pseudocyesis, which is false pregnancy. And as he talked to her, he discovered that all of her brothers, sisters all had children, her friends all had children. They had been trying to get pregnant for 10 years. And finally, after missing her period for three months, she declared, I'm pregnant. And she got so excited, the hormones kicked in, and she had you know, the big belly and everything else, but, but she wasn't mm -hmm. pregnant. So what does Dr. Martin do? Well... I certainly don't agree with what he did, but he lied to her. He said, you're right, you're going to deliver today. You don't have time to get to a, to a hospital. I'll deliver you right here. So he got her nice and comfortable. In fact, she fell asleep for a few minutes, and when she woke up, he was right there with her. And he said, I'm sorry, but we lost the baby. Oh, no. And we did everything we could, and this is really heartbreaking, and this is really hard. And the medical records indicate that as soon as he said that, her tummy began going down. But Rob, she bounced into his office a week later, just as big as before. And she declared, Doctor, you forgot to deliver my twin. The brain believes everything. So let's go maybe a step further, and this is why this gets me thrilled with excitement. If mm -hmm. everything we can do today is based primarily on what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves today, we can change what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves when, Rob? Today. And what does your brain say? Okay. Is it true? Don't care. All I care is what you tell me. Now, why is that so wonderful to know? Because when people say things like, you know what, I'm really stuck. I've always been this way. I really can't change. You know what the brain says? Okay. You're right. You're stuck. You can't change. Absolutely. But when you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, when did my old life end? You know when your old life ended, Rob? About a second ago. Which means you know when your new life began? About a second ago. So do the math. If you've got 
60 seconds per minute and 60 minutes per hour and 24 hours per day. In one 24-hour period, you have 84,600 new opportunities for a new life. Now, people can say, well, that's just a stupid way of, of thinking. And when you say that, what's your brain going to say? Yeah, it is. You're right. It is. Absolutely. But you can also say, wait a minute. I like that. I can use it. And what does your brain say to that? Okay. And then it looks for ways of using it. In other words, everything that we can do today is based on what we're saying to ourselves about ourselves today. So I, I guess there's two... Two little um, phrases that come to mind. If you confess it, you will possess it, number one. And number two, yes. to thine own self be true. Yes. And uh, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, mm -hmm. so is he. Yeah. Example, um, for the first 42 years of life, I said to myself, I'm really stupid in math. And guess what, Rob? I was really dumb in math. But I discovered I was one of the first computer geeks. I'm 70 years old. So I began experimenting with computers and eventually got a graduate degree in computer science and began teaching computer courses at this particular university. And one day the dean came to me. He said, one of our math professors just quit, so you're a new math professor. <gasps> I can't do numbers. You want a job? Learn. There's the book. Mm -hmm. So I ran down to the library. This is in the early 80s, way before the internet. And I picked up all the books that I'm bringing based on That's how this whole thing started. And I began teaching my course based on how the brain learns. And students began saying, gosh, you're such a good math teacher. And the dean came back and said, you know what? You're causing a problem. Students say, I will only teach math if Mr. Campbell teaches it. And what I did, Rob, is I began changing the messages I was giving to myself. I began saying, wait a minute. If I'm so smart with computer software, I've got to be smart with math. Right. And what did my brain say? Okay. Was it true? Don't care. But in this case, it was. In fact, in the end, I ended up writing two college textbooks on computer software involving a lot of what do you think? Math. Was it magic? No. It's simply saying, this is the way I am, and the brain says, okay. And it doesn't ask whether it's true. The brain locks onto it. Now, here's the second part that's so exciting. In 2002, a book was written called in Search of Memory by Dr. Eric Kandel, and he was sure. one of the people that coined the phrase neuroplasticity. Here's, some, here's so a phrase I to hate to talk about, but I do have to take this commercial break. Please stand by. Okay. Exxon Nation. Okay. Stephen Campbell is my, back, my guest, and uh, we'll both be back on the other side of this break right after the news. Don't go away. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. 
Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Stephen Campbell. He is the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent, and his website is www.stephenrcampbell.com. Stephen, what you're saying is, if you'll excuse the expression, very simplistic, and yet yes, it, it is. works. Tremendously so. It works. In fact, the, the primary, and this isn't me talking, this is years and years mm-hmm. of cognitive psychology and hundreds of studies that I haven't done, but, but it's been done. The primary element, Rob, that holds all of us back from learning and growing and changing is what we are saying to ourselves. It isn't the way we were raised. It isn't the way we were born. It's what we are saying to ourselves. In fact, let's go a step deeper, which is even more exciting. We've been talking about how we're feeling, but uh, thinking, but you know what? As important as that is how we're feeling. Because we're not thinking people who feel, we're feeling people who think. And this is also a conclusion from psychology that began in the early 60s by, again, Dr. Albert Ellis, Mm -hmm. who wrote his wonderful book. And what we've learned about our feelings is that our feelings, Rob, don't come from how we were raised. They don't come from what we're doing. They don't come from events in our lives. Where do they come from? Where do they come from? Us? From our beliefs about how we were raised and our beliefs about what we are doing. And our beliefs about events in our lives. So, but what about and a person who change those beliefs? What about a person who has a very vivid imagination? How does Absolutely. this? How does this system work? Because this person is changing yeah. their thoughts, changing their beliefs every, every you know every couple of hours. That's right. That's right. Now we get into what is called the the, the self concept or the, the self image. Okay. It turns out, and I'm a first-year baby boomer, so I was taught that you have a self-image, you have to maintain your self-image. That's only partially correct. Mm -hmm. We have millions of self-images. We have a self-image for every single thing that we can do, our abilities, our habits, our aptitudes, our relationships. We all have these self-images, and they are learned. They're they're what is called a pattern, okay? And they're learned. You weren't born with them. You were born with certain natural dispositions. I was always a teacher. But teaching was something they had to learn. But you have all these self-images, and they're based on your self-talk. They're based on what you are saying to yourself about yourself. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, when I was eight years old, let's imagine I'm a little boy, and I spend a, an hour 
drawing the T-Rex in my room. And I take it to my sister, Shirley, who's the expert because she has her drawings in the refrigerator. She's five years older than I am. And I show her my T-Rex, and she says, look, I say, look, 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 look at this. And she says, oh, Stephen, that's stupid. You can't draw. Shirley has given me an opinion. My brain records that opinion. I can't draw Shirley. I take it to my sister. I show it to her. She says the same thing. Sally says, I can't draw, so my brain records that. So you have two little opinions that are now connected. But what about Sally the person says, who, who Shirley, takes I'm the... Sorry. What, what happens? What about the person who, who takes this negative, you can't draw, and turns mm-hmm. it and says, you know what? I'll show you I can draw. Bingo. What he's done is he's saying, you know what? I'm not taking that anymore into account. Those self-images, you can't get rid of them because they're hardwired. They're really hard to change because most of what we say is negative stuff to ourselves. That's called negative bias. But what you just said is true. What you can do is replace them by new thoughts. Replace them by new beliefs. Mm -hmm. And here's the exciting part. When you replace those new beliefs and you lock onto those new beliefs, your brain literally rewires itself so that new, those new beliefs become a part of who you are. That's how I wrote gotcha. my book in math. Because I rewired myself, I locked onto those new beliefs that I'm really smart in math, and just what happens I am, mm-hmm. and the rest is history. Mm-hmm. So while you're talking to yourself, you're creating and you're changing all these self-images. But here's the important point. When you have one you're just not crazy about, rather than try to change it or try to get rid of it, you create a brand new one by simply mm. changing what you're saying to yourself about yourself. You so see, Here's so, another principle. The brain doesn't like change, Rob. Mm-hmm. The brain wants to keep you safe. The brain wants to keep you secure. If you change, what if it doesn't work? You tried that the last time. I don't really like that. That makes me feel uncomfortable. So the brain's really fighting and can change. But you know what? The brain loves to create. It loves to create new things. So when you have a self-image like I did of being stupid in math, Mm -hmm. rather than changing that, I replaced it. I created a new self-image for myself. By changing what I was saying to myself about myself, my brain said, okay. And that's where it gets exciting. Wow. But what about people who are very susceptible to the power of suggestion. People are getting suckered in left, right, and center by the subliminal advertising that is on the television, the radio, and everywhere, you know, your grocery stores yes. and all this. So if they're susceptible to subliminal messaging and subliminal advertising, how can they then maintain a track when it's when they're trying to convince or they're saying, I can do this. I can't do this, or I should say, I can do this, and they, yeah. and they follow your 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 practice and your procedures. Well, number one, by being aware of what they are saying to themselves, can either be really dangerous or really positive. Mm-hmm. So to watch their self talk, okay, and also realize this that all those subliminals and all the things they see on TV and all the advertisements, what and what other people say to them about themselves. What other people say to them about themselves do not become a part of them until they agree with them. You have to agree with something before it becomes a part of you. So let me give you an example. Uh, I ended up teaching math at the University of San Francisco. The student came to the office after the first day of class, sat down. She was very shy. She says, Miss Campbell, I'm so glad you're my professor, but I'm a C student in math. And I just can't get above a C. So I worked with her because I said I used to be that same way. She got an A in the first mentor. I was so excited. I gave her the tourist. She looked at it. She freaked out. She looked up at me and Rob. She said, Mr. Campbell, this is a mistake. I said, what do you mean, Sue? She said, I have never gotten above a C in a test. You must have made a mistake. And I said, well, I didn't. This is a genuine A. So then she looked at the test longer, Rob, and then she looked up at me with a big smile on her face, and she said, do you know what this means? And, of course, I'm a teacher, so I sat down next to her, and I said, yeah, I do, Sue, but you tell me, what does this mean? This means that when I flunk my next math test, I can still maintain my C. (laughs) I said, Sue, just get A in every test. She said, I can't, Mr. Campbell. Why? What was her answer, Rob? I'm a C student. 
And that's exactly what happened. She fucked the next test you got to see in the course. Now, I sat down with her, with, with Ye. I said, Sue, answer me this. What would have happened if you would flunk this first test? Rob, do you know what she said to me? No. In a mo- it was, immediately she said, easy, I would have stood like crazy good A on the next test. I'd have to maintain my C. Mm. I said, Sue, just get an A in every test. She said, I can't. Why? Because I'm a C student. I've always been this way. I can't make this change. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm from this culture. It's always been this way. Or, 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 wait a minute. The only person that my brain listens to is me. My brain is a captive audience. And I'm the only person it really listens to. So when I say I can change those things, my brain says, okay. Is it automatic? Of course it isn't. But is, 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 do, there, is there, a, is there a, a system built into the brain that if you say, I'm going to do this, and it's something that you would morally not do, will your brain still allow you to do it because you are giving the command? Well, it's, it's, there's a couple of problems with what you just said. When you say, I'm going to do this, mm-hmm. or I will do that, you know mm-hmm. what the brain says? The brain says, hope you do. Sounds great. All right, so, so, what, so what, is, what, should the, uh, what, what is the key to this? How do you address the brain? The key to this is I'm doing it right now. I'm doing it right now. Let me give you an example. Let me give you another story, because the stories illustrate this so well. My father died when he was very young, and mm-hmm. Mary said to me, if you die early, I'll kill you. Gotcha. I was about 40 pounds more than I weigh now. So I said, okay, I need to lose this weight. So I get up and run and swim, and I lose maybe two or three pounds a week. Get all back to the weekend. I did that for 25 years because of what I said to myself. I said to myself, you are a 240-pound man who's got to lose 40 pounds. When I said, you are a 240-pound man, my brain said, okay. And then it said, my job is to keep you at 240 pounds because I will not let you be unlike yourself. If you say you're 240, I'll make sure you stay that way. After 25 years, I said, well, this isn't working. So I began studying all this stuff. I realized I was giving myself the wrong message. So I began saying, and they call this an affirmation for want of a better word, I began saying, I look great at 200. Mm -hmm. Look at me now. And my brain freaked out. It said, hello, (laughs) excuse me, reality check here. Look at the scale. Look at the mirror. You are not 200, you're 240. And I said, no, that's what I'm locking on to. That's how I see myself. And every single time I sit down for a meal, I'm going to eat like a 200-pound person. That's what I'm locking on to. Over time, the brain realized how serious I was, and it enabled me to do that. Now, here's the important point. For those 25 years, not only did I say, you are a 240-pound man, I also said, you will lose 30 pounds or 40 pounds. When my brain said, Mm -hmm. when I said, you will lose 40 pounds, my brain said, good luck. Hope you do. Sounds wonderful. I'm not going to do a thing because, first of all, I have nothing to do with the future. And number two, I'm so busy dealing with the present that I'm not going to worry about the future. So you keep your goals all it was in the future, sometime out there, and I don't have to do a thing. But when I began saying, I'm there now, and I look great, then the brain popped up and said, ooh, wait a minute. Now we have a problem because there's a gap between reality and what you're saying. And now we'll get into what's called gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology basically says the brain hates gaps. So I saw myself at 200. I was 240. The Mm -hmm. brain said, we've got to close the gap. Now, the first thing the brain does is it says, give up, Steve. You've been trying to lose weight for 25 years. It'll always be 240 pounds. Just give up. That's the easier way to do it. After 25 years, I said, no. No. I see myself at 200 pounds. I'm locking on to that. And what happens is, over time, the brain rewired itself, again, neuroplasticity, and I saw myself at 200 pounds. And eating like a 200-pound person became easier and easier and easier until after about a year I lost the weight. Now, here's the important point, Rob. There is still a Mm self-image in my brain of a 240 pound person. It's still there. How do I know? Because I've never had a lobotomy. 
I've never had it cut out. So it's still back there somewhere. We have trillions of self-images. The point is, is that I haven't seen it for years. Every single time I sit down for a meal, Mm -hmm. I see myself as a 200-pound person doing it, and it becomes easier and easier and easier. So it doesn't matter of, of spending the rest of your life struggling with this. The exciting part is that the brain rewires itself so the struggle becomes less and less and less, and what you're saying becomes a part of who you are more and more and more. This sounds like self-hypnosis. In a sense, it is. Here's an interesting, here's an interesting story of self-hypnosis. Let's mm-hmm. imagine that you're in one of my classes, and I hypnotize you. Mm-hmm. And I put a uh, mouse in front of you. I put it. Oh, let's say I put an iPhone in front of you, and I hypnotize you. And I say, "This iPhone weighs 500 pounds, and if you pick it up, I'll give you a thousand dollars." Okay. Now you're hypnotized, thinking that the iPhone weighs 500 pounds. Now I'm assuming, Rob, that you're not a weightlifter, so I don't think you could probably lift 500 pounds. So one of your self images in your brain mm-hmm. that's wired in there is that you cannot lift 500 pounds, okay? Okay, so you reach over, grab the mouse, try to lift it, and it, the mouse doesn't budge. And you're really trying because you, you want the mouse. So what I do, because I don't really know you that well, is I put some uh, electrodes on your biceps, mm-hmm. the muscles that push, pull up, and I put the other side to some sort of a medical measuring device. It shows that you're lifting, Rob, with about 40 pounds worth of weight, with 40 pounds worth of force. The iPhone doesn't budge even though you're lifting with enough force to throw it across the room. Why doesn't it budge? Why doesn't it move even when you're lifting with enough force? Remember this forever. If I attach electrodes to your triceps, the muscles that push down, can you guess what it's going to show? It's going to show that while you're lifting with 40 pounds mm-hmm. for the $1,000, right. you're pushing down with 40 pounds for sanity. Because your brain says, I can't do this. And your brain makes sure you can't. Now, if I stop there and I don't, that would be really depressing. But then I say to my audience, now look at this. The point is, is when you say, I cannot do this, the brain makes really sure you can't. However, when you say, I can do this, the brain becomes obsessed with finding ways for you to do it. All right, stand by. We've got to take our final break. Exonation. Nation, Stephen Campbell is our guest. He is the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent. And his website is stephenrcampbell.com. And we'll both be back on the other side as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions 
including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Stephen R. Campbell is our guest this hour. He's the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent, and his website is Stephen R. Campbell. Dot com. If our mind only accepts what it is, is told mm-hmm. in the now, and you, that example that you gave us of uh, self-hypnosis or some sort of hypnosis mm-hmm. with the iPhone, mm-hmm. why did my mind listen to you? Because... When you go inside of the mind, there's there's a conversation going on. Mm-hmm. Um, if I showed you a slide, a, a downward slide of the brain, left and right, okay? Mm-hmm. We've known for centuries there's a left and right side of the brain. However, we did not know that they thought differently until the early 70s with the work of Dr. Roger Sperry, who got a Nobel Prize for his work on split brain experiments. Mm-hmm. When we look at the brain, the left side is for language, for logic. So when you're talking to yourself, it's coming from the left side. And when you're talking to me, it's coming from the left side. Okay? Okay. Okay. The other side is where the real you is. It's where your passions are, your feelings, your creativity. So the left side talks to the right side, just as the left side talks to me. Okay? And the right side reacts and responds to what the left side is saying. Now, we used to think that the right side accepted everything the left side says. But what we're beginning to discover Mm -hmm. is that's not necessarily true. The right side can also say, wait a minute, I don't think so. And the left side says, okay. 
In fact, I tell my audience what I want to do with, with you is to help you make you healthy skeptics, is help you understand that you don't have to accept everything the brain is saying to you or everything that someone else is saying to you. You can make choices. That's why they call this cognitive psychology. It really comes down to the choices that you're making. So when you're talking to yourself, you really, there is a conversation going on between the left and the right. How many different types sense? of psychology is there? Like cognitive psychology is one. Oh, How many I've are got it. I have a book in my library uh, that, that, let's see, 50, I have to look over here, but there's 50, there's, I'm not, I don't think there's many different, as 50 different psychologists, but there's, there's, there's all sorts of different ones. I couldn't tell you how many though. Probably in the in the in the dozens so and dozens. Are they all right or are they all wrong? Well, they've grown. Um, as I said before, when cognitive came out, mm -hmm. the Freudian then said, "No, no," because cognitive said everything you are today is based on what you say yourself today, and the Freudian said, "No, no, no. Everything you are today is based on your childhood, unresolved childhood conflicts." That was followed by behaviorism, as I said. That was followed by, it's on your genes. That didn't last too long. That was followed by environmentalism. And the answer to your question is that Dr. Ellis said, and, and this is pretty much agreed upon now, they're all true in a sense. How could they all be true? Because when you say it, your brain makes it true. So I was the way I was for 42 years in math because of the way I was raised. And I'll go into all the details of my dad and my mom and all that. But I was that way because of the way I was raised. And I kept saying that to myself. I'm this way because of the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. Okay? And there's nothing I can do about it. Might as well accept it. Da, da, da. Then when I was 42, and I showed you the story of what happened with the math and all that, I began switching what I was saying to myself. I began saying, no, I'm not going to believe that anymore. I'm going to switch the message. I'm going to say to myself, I'm really smart with math because I discovered it when I was teaching that. I really was. And the more I said that, the truer it became. And then we go into neuroplasticity, which is basically saying, you keep saying it, you lock onto it, and the brain makes it true. It's sort of like when my father taught me how to ride a bicycle. He took me out to this field, took the train, he was off. And he said, now, son, before I give you a little shove, you see that rock on the road out there about 50 feet? Yes, Daddy. Don't run into that rock. So, Rob, you already know what happened. I got down on my bike. I was locked onto the rock so I would not run into it. Mm -hmm. Heading like mad. What happened? You hit the Bam. rock. Right into the rock. Yeah. That's the way our brain works. Our brain locks onto what we lock Onto. All right, so so, let me, so I, we're, we're we're running short on time here, Doc. But uh, yeah. if if this method was to be used in schools throughout the United States, Canada, and and wherever it is deemed necessary, would that mean we'd have all these smart kids and stupidity would be a thing of the past? Stupidity. Let I don't want to say a thing like I, I'm I'm rather cautious about that, but I, 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 I give these presentations to elementary schools and, mm -hmm. and high schools all over Sonoma County where I live, and um, the kids love this. It doesn't help their, their intelligence, but mainly, Rob, it helps what they are saying to themselves about ourselves. I've had so many students come up to me because it started in the college. So it helps their self-esteem. And they say, what? I'm sorry. It, it helps their self-esteem. Yes, it helps yourself. It helps what they are saying to themselves about herself. Rather than saying I'm so stupid with math, they say, you know what? I'm not the smartest with math, but I'm learning. I'm getting better. I can do this. And the brain says, absolutely. So it really helps what they're saying to themselves, their self talk. And I give these seminars to school districts all over California because the kids love it and the, and the superintendents love it. And the teachers but, love but it. But is it making a difference in the grades? Yes, it is. In fact, I just did one in, up in uh, Nevada City next to Sacramento, mm -hmm. and the superintendent said, I won't give you the whole story, but the superintendent said, a mother came to her the next day. She said her son's been having problems with his math, mm -hmm. and she was sitting down with him after her son came to my seminar, and she was saying, I know how hard it is. I was really dumb at math, and he caught her at it. He said, Mom, no, you weren't, and I'm not either. I'm just challenged. 
but that doesn't mean it's stupid. What does the challenge? What, do, what does the challenge reader. that this child is talking about? What does that cha- that challenge relate to? I'm sorry. Say that again, please. Ron. The child said he was challenged. How was yes. he challenged? Well, he's challenged in that he math is a challenge for him. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean he's stupid, and it just takes longer for him to understand. But that's true of everything. For well, some with, things, with, it's really easy for us to understand. For other things, it's just harder. Is math really necessary stupid. in today's society when we have handheld devices that can solve any problem that we have just by tapping in figures? Are we wasting too much time on the old school and not getting in line with the new school? Well, my opinion on that is that it's not really solving problems. It's giving you more information. The solution to the problems still have to come with us. They have to come from our brains. It's given us gobs of information. Mm-hmm. In fact, sometimes it gives us too much information. But the solution still has to come from you and me. All right. If I'm given Using a mathematical devices. if I'm given a mathematical equation, all I have to do is pick up my my uh, my smartphone, put it into the calculator mode, and I don't need to understand the the you know like when I was in school it was long division, then there was calculus, then there was algebra. The smart machine or the mm-hmm. smartphone does it for me. So are mm-hmm. we really accomplishing anything by by giving the children the old school methods in a modern day society? Well, the nice thing about doing it from the old way is to teach them it is teaching them how to think. It is teaching them how to think rather than an iPhone teaching them how to think. It's teaching him how to use logic and process his information. When I taught math, one mm-hmm. of the things I emphasized was not so much the math as much as, like, when I taught algebra. I said, look upon algebra as a game. Mm-hmm. It's a fun game that you can use to solve problems. And they love that, whereas they used to think algebra was just this really hard discipline. Yeah. When I said to them, no, this is a game. This is to make fun. It taught them how to think. It taught them how to think logically. So and that's what we still need. All right. So if we have all these devices who do who that that do the thinking for us, so what's the sense of advancing mm-hmm. in society when we still have to do everything the old way just because it, you know, because we need to think about it? It teaches well, us how to think. Well, it's the old way. It's it's a way that's really necessary. In other words, when I'm talking to you, mm-hmm. I'm not using my iPhone to communicate my feelings and what I'm thinking. I'm using right. my mouth. I'm yeah. using my brain. And yet so many people do and that. yet so many people today use texting instead of telephone calls. That's because and I think that's sad, they don't like the face to face. Is it sad or and is this or is this a, a, is this proof that society is moving in a direction that is new, challenging, experiencing oh, uh, yeah, exciting. Absolutely. You know? Oh yes. Yeah. If you look at it that way, which I do, but there's parts of it that because I'm from the old school, not crazy about it, but mm-hmm. it's coming and it's there, and I think it's exciting too. If I didn't have that, all of that stuff, I wouldn't be being able to sitting with you talking clear across the world mm-hmm. with my iPhone or having a PowerPoint point in front of me and all the other things that we can do. So without that, we wouldn't be wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff. All right, uh, plus I wouldn't know all this stuff because of the internet. Stephen, you and I have to you and I have to got to say so long for tonight. I want to thank you so much for joining us, Exo Nation. My guest this hour has been Stephen R. Campbell. His website is www.stephenrcampbell.com, and he is the author of Making Your Mind Magnificent. Do me a favor, Exo Nation. Tell me if you're a believer or a skeptic. Send me an email: studio at exoneradiotv.com. That's studio at exxoneradiotv.com. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away.